I believe I was uh, asked to come here today because um, the addiction that we see in our community very often starts with our youth. And on the ground every day uh, with the staff at Kent Island High School and the other schools in Queen Anne's County. Uh, I, I will tell you some Kent Island High School stuff today, but if you are from the northern end of the county, I believe I can speak for them and say they are seeing very, very similar trends in their school as well. One of the things that I'll point to right away is this, if you ever want to see, get like a barometer measure of how our community is doing on almost anything, from COVID rates to community attitudes about things, you stop into schools. Because we get from almost every household, every part of the community, merging in together every single day. And so if you really want to know how something's going in our community, it's not always the best thing just to ask your neighbors right around you. The school shows you kind of everybody all together. And I believe that's why I'm here today. So I wanted to share a few things with you. Number one, we'll start a little bit happy. Uh, Everything's going pretty well. That, that's what school should be about. I know I should probably, as the principal, put on like tests and work and classes and stuff too, but football's up and running. I mean, we did really well this year. We just got done. Some of you probably saw the Little Mermaid play and everything that should be happening at a high school. The, the picture perfect ideal that we would like to just think that's what's happening at a high school. Kids are in there doing their thing. Maybe they say some bad words and no big deal. The principal will take care of it. Sometimes it's a little more intense than that. We are back to normal. The masks are off, the kids are happy with that, but now we're starting to, we, we really did see in the fall, and also as we progress through the winter, kids kind of showing up a little bit, I'm gonna just call it like it is. Warren Wright, he saw me at the door, he's like, well, there's gonna be a lot of truth if Ken is here. So I'm gonna speak the truth. The kids came in a little off. They came in a little psychologically not what we left them with probably natural, 18 months separated away from school, and we saw some very, very strange behaviors. Um, but some of that is returning to normal. Some of it, I always say to parents, don't overthink this. Kids don't change in many ways. The picture on the left is what passing notes looked like when I was in school, and some of you are in school. The picture on the right is what passing notes looks like now. The cool thing for the kids on the right is it's kind of a little more secretive. I don't get caught, and if I get caught, the teacher can't necessarily read my note aloud. The mean stuff that happens at school still happens. The difference is, on the left, it was you had to be there. And on the right, now it kind of happens all the time. And I'll say this to all of the moms, dads, and grandparents in the room, and if you're like, what does this have to do with addiction, watch this theme will come back around. When I had a problem when I was a high school student, if I was under peer pressure for something or somebody was bothering me or we were almost gonna get in a fight or something at school, once I got on that bus and went home, I could turn off. I could have dinner with my family, I was home, it was fine, I was away from that stress. Do not lose sight of the fact that the students the youth in our community now don't play by the same rules that you grew up with. They never get to go home and turn off. If they have a problem at school, it's always there. If there's somebody picking on them, pressuring them to do something, you see where I'm going with this, it's always there. When they go lay down at night and plug that phone in to charge next to their bed, it literally buzzes to them all night long while they sleep. The rules are different for the kids that are in school these days. They don't understand the world you grew up in, adults, and we don't understand, I'm looking at some adolescents here this morning, this afternoon, they don't understand your rules and we don't understand theirs. And so mom and dad, be careful when you jump. Grandma, grandpa, whoever's talking to the kids, be careful when you jump to, why are you doing this? I don't understand. Yes, you don't understand. It's not something you ever had to deal with. I, the, the beginning to name this generation the iGen generation. The picture on the left was how most of the adults in this room grew up. The picture on the right 
is how our adolescents and the youth in our community live every day. If you want to be cool, if you want to be relevant, if you want to gain the acceptance of your peers, you have to be a presence online. When somebody does something online, you either have to repeat it or up it. We've all heard stories of kids sending inappropriate pictures of themselves to other kids. I'm the father of two daughters, and I sat there and why, why are we doing this? And I'm so thankful that I was in education because I could see it. The boys put pressure on the girls in the past to send me a love note or give me a kiss. And now the new thing is send me this picture. And this girl will send it to me. If you don't, then I don't want to talk to you. That's the pressure that our kids are under with social media. It's always, always there, and it really defines how their brains develop. And I'm about to tra transition into the addiction part. It really redefines how their brains develop. Your brains developed biologically. The, the synapses, the neurons in your brain, adults born before the internet age, formed differently then their brains are forming. Neuroscientists are looking at that right now and their brain structures are different. Their risk reward structures are different. They get excited and teenagers that are sitting here in the room right now will probably not nod their heads because they don't want to let you know this, but when I say this, they know it's true. They get excited when they get a like, when they get a ding, when that phone makes a little noise. And parents and grandparents, you know it's true because it happens to you too. It actually releases in your brain a little bit of a drug, dopamine, that gives you a little tiny high. And that little bell and that little ding that somebody approved of you, somebody liked it, makes you want another hit off of the drug that's in your brain that your own body is feeding you. If you ever want to hear, I've, I've done a couple presentations in our community about why is my teenager acting this way. I can break down the whole brain thing for you if you're a parent or grandparent wondering why your teenager is so off the chain. And the, the kids, I think, get a lot out of it too. But just remember, they don't understand your perspective either. So what does this have to do with addiction? The pressure is out there. and I. I, I will share this bias with you right from the outset. I'm a social studies teacher, and my training all the way through college taught me follow the money. There's money to be made out there for addicting your children to different substances. There's money to be made by the people directly selling to them. There's a ton of money to be made by the people manufacturing it. We're gonna break down a little bit of what we're seeing at the high school. So what does addiction have to do with that? That little dopamine release that happens in your brain, and like I said, adults, you know it too. When that, bit, when that thing rings, oh, I wanna see what the picture is. Oh, I, I mean, some of you, your phone is buzzing right now and you're not looking at it and it's killing you. <laughs> it's killing you. Because your brain wants the dopamine hit. It wants it, it's just a little bit, but it wants the dopamine hit. And when you pop that screen open, you get it. Couple that with chemical drugs outside of the body instead of just the pharmacy from within, and you have a very, very toxic setup now. 2019, probably the last real survey we had pre-pandemic of kids and tobacco usage and drug uses and all this stuff. 2019, number one reason they tried it? Curiosity. Now I'm gonna tell you something, and I have People sitting in the audience here who know me, so they're gonna record this and quote it and call me out on it later, but did I try a cigarette when I was younger? Yes. Did I try alcohol when I was younger? Yes. Why? Curiosity. That hasn't changed. That's the same thing, and most of the adults in this room went through its curiosity. It's a cool thing, it's an adult thing, I'm gonna see how it feels, I'm gonna try it. The problem now, adults, is that there is an online social media presence that you can't fathom that is pushing them beyond the peers that they see in the hallway or on the school bus. It's in their face all the time. You see it too. 
You Google, I want to buy a new set of lacrosse balls because I'm a lacrosse coach. All you do is get lacrosse ball ads for like the next three months, right? Because social media targets you. And it knows how old you are. And it knows where you live. And it knows who your friends are. And it knows what your friends are into. The stuff that comes across our students' social media is unbelievable peer pressure, the likes of which are not in any textbooks yet. We're still trying to figure it all out. It's there all the time. The pressure to do what everybody else does increases the curiosity. And, and let me say, I don't want to turn this into cell phones and social media, because we all have it, and we all have our phones right next to us. I wake up in the morning before I get out of bed, I look at it. I know, I'm the same way. But the problem is the stuff that's targeting down to the kid's phone is different than what you're waking up and looking at in the morning. You wake up and look at CNN or Fox News, they're looking at ads for different stuff. And you'll never know it. If you don't know what these look like, and I think sometimes it's really easy for the community to go, well, this is just vaping. This is like the new cigarette smoking. How bad could this be? As principal of Kent Island High School, I'll tell you, I've seen every single one of those devices that's up on the screen, except the one that looks like the old fashioned pipe that my grandfather smoked. I haven't seen that one yet. But just about everything else on that screen, we have seen at Kent Island High School. Some of you are looking at them for the first time going, what is that? I don't even know what that is. They're call them e-cigarettes, call them vape pens, call them fuses, call them whatever you want. They're a method to deliver both nicotine at first, which is normally where it starts, and then other substances after that, after we get you hooked. I will tell you, depending on the potency of the nicotine that they're putting into vape pens and stuff, they will get addicted to the nicotine 10 times faster than somebody who started smoking cigarettes. If you smoked a cigarette, me, I'm not asking you to raise your hand, I'm just saying me. If you smoked a cigarette when you were a teenager because you were curious and you wanted to try it, but you didn't get addicted, it's probably because you didn't smoke like packs of cigarettes. You tried them a couple times and went, this is gross, I don't like it, and moved on. The problem is kids who try the vapes are usually inhaling an immense amount of nicotine right out of the gate. And the body goes, oh yeah. We want this. So what happens? At Kent Island High School, for those of you in the back who can't see it, 79 students. I, that's the number of students we have caught vaping so far this year. When I made the presentation on Wednesday, it was 77. I updated it on Friday before I left because we got two more. That's a significant percentage of our school, and I'll tell you it's way more than 7% of Kent Island High School students are using vapes. The number at the bottom, three, and I told everybody who asked me to present today, and like I said, Mr. Wright knows, I'll, I'll be brutally honest, three students we've caught distributing stuff, either vapes or the stuff that's in vapes, that I'm gonna get to in a second, beyond nicotine. These devices that a lot of adults who don't use it don't even recognize when they see it sometimes look like USB drives, they have to heat up the oil before they vape in all the stuff. So sometimes adults don't even know what they're looking at when they might come across it sitting on the kitchen table. And then they come into the school and the students use them for nicotine at first and then other things beyond that. Because the nature of addiction is I'm not getting high enough, I want my high to get better. Gentleman at the top, is, that's, that image is from a website that tells you how to infuse synthetic THC into vapes, how you can create it at home if you have the right materials, and put it into the vape. Down at the bottom are a few examples of ones you can just buy that have THC in them. The one on the left is Sour Patch Kids, one of my favorite candies, because I'm a big, giant little boy. But if I'm, I'll go back to my social studies, follow the money, if I'm making synthetic THC pods to put into these things and putting a Sour Patch Kids flavor on it, I'm marketing it to children. Some states have already started moving on that and penalizing those companies and shutting them down and all that kind of stuff. Some states haven't. It's in our school. When I walk into the bathroom, people are vaping at Ken Island High School. 
I don't smell tobacco. I smell watermelon. I smell strawberry. I smell vanilla. They are tasty. They are wonderful. And here's the biggest thing of all. It is social. And so the kids that you think, like right now you're sitting there going, Kenna, yeah, those three kids who are distributing it in school, I can picture what that kid looks like. No, you can't. You would be floored to find out who those kids were. You want to say good kids, bad kids? I'll put every one of those three who got that caught, caught distributing at school in the good kids column. You will not see them walking around the community with their head chopped off. We took care of it. We moved on. I'm going to talk about that in a minute as well. It's not who you think it is. It's so widespread because it feels safe. It looks safe. Originally, it was marketed as this is a way you stop smoking. It takes away all the toxins. But then we poured all this other stuff into it. I got kids, I'll be honest, I got kids walking down the hallway sometimes. I go, I stay right to them. You are high. And I go search them, and it's not there. The one on the right is disposable. I use it. I throw it away in the trash. It's loaded. And if, if any of you have used marijuana as like a joint, 10 times more potent. The THC in this stuff is boiled down to the synthetic chemical, that psycho drug that makes you high, and it's potent. So a couple quick puffs that taste like strawberry, and math class is going to be a whole lot more fun. At least that's what you think. That's what you're dealing with. And it has become a social event, both social face-to-face, -face, because there's 20 kids hanging out in the bathroom, all passing around a vape, yay, COVID. And it's also social online, because they'll go home and out in the community on the weekend. I guarantee, if I was on all my students' social media right now, I'd pull thousands of images of me just blowing vape towards the screen. It's social. It's look what I'm doing. Look how much fun I'm having. So what do we do? And I only have a couple more slides left. I'm a professional educator. I know not to talk too long. But um, what do we do? I, I think one of the themes I hope you hear today is we're not executing people. people I know there's some people like, Kenna, why don't you just suspend those kids for like 20 days, send them home, kick them out of school, whatever. As soon as I suspend that kid, what happens? They go home and do it some more. I have had, over the course of the, this school year so far, 20 different parents sitting in my office crying their eyes out saying, what should I do? What do I do? I'm going to yell at my kid. I'm going to strangle him. Fine. But that doesn't cure the addiction. We're not dealing with a behavior here. There are kids who get in trouble. I'll tell you a quick story without a name, because the dad said I, I could use it at this, uh, use, I could use this story. There was a kid, third time getting busted with this stuff, and I was so angry at him, and Dad was so angry at him. I said, Dad, I had him on the phone. Dad couldn't pick him up. I said, I'm driving him home. I'm going to drive him home right now. His mom's there. She's going to do whatever she's going to do to him. I said, I'm taking his cell phone before I put him in my car because I don't want him to record what it is I'm going to say. And we had a long, long drive all the way back to Graysonville. And I use some not very principally words because I feel like that's what that kid needs. And by the time we got back, he's sitting there in tears and he's like, I want to stop. I'm trying to stop. He said, you don't understand, Mr. Ken. I'm trying to stop. I just can't. And we stood in his driveway and talked for 10 minutes. And I said, because you're sitting, I know what's happening. You're sitting in math class. You don't want to go to the bathroom and vape. But your body's saying, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. An extreme version I'll come back to the cell phone that's in your pocket right now that you want to pick up and look at because your body will give you a little dopamine. His body can't get through math class because he's addicted to it. So suspending and chopping heads off doesn't work. The state of Maryland has asked the school districts not to do that so much anyway. So there are classes they have to go to. I'm a big fan of taking time out of their day as far as discipline goes. So your school day gets extended by two hours. So I catch you vaping. You just hang out here with me. But I know that's not going to stop it. That doesn't stop addiction. And so I get into conversations with parents about nicotine patches and nicotine gum for your 14-year-old. And it's ridiculous. But I look at them and say, that's the route you have to go. Get up in his business. 
be in his bedroom, be in his phone, don't care. So I'll end with good news and bad news. I'll give you the good news first. A recent study that just came out from the FDA suggested that the vaping stuff with teenagers has plateaued. It's plateaued pretty high, uh, as you can see by this chart. We're looking at about 27% of kids um, that in, by the FDA study said have used within the last 30 days or are currently using. That number is high, but it seems to be leveling out. And so the good news here is maybe the message is getting out to kids like this is really, really not good and we've kind of stopped the bleeding, but now we have to deal with the injury. If we've stopped more kids from getting into this, great, but now we have to deal with the kids that are because they, unfortunately, the bad news, as we know with addiction, this is my last slide, and then I'll shut up. As we know with addiction, you just keep getting high until the high isn't enough and then you find the next thing that makes the high even better. You just keep ramping it up unless somebody intervenes at some point and legitimately puts the brakes on it. And so nicotine turns into THC. We're seeing more and more of that at the school. And I would love to tell you, I'm not, I don't think any of my high school kids do anything past that. I would be lying to you. I know that some of them have already reached the next level of they need the next high. And so this isn't quite opioids and sitting there shooting heroin in your bedroom or anything like that, but this is where it starts. And if they're on this downward slide now, they're just going to look for the next level of high. And it usually will happen. I know families and community are all very supportive, but we're sometimes kids look at me like, this is like being in jail. Everybody's always watching me. I can't walk around the hallway by myself. Right. There's structure. We're watching you. As soon as that goes away and they walk out the door at 18, 19 years old, the world opens up to them and they go after that next level of high. The scariest part is how quickly it progresses. It just moves so fast. A kid three months ago might have been doing nothing, and this, the potency of the things they're using at school just drive the addiction forward. At this point, I believe I'm supposed to turn it over to Sheriff Hoffman, um, who's gonna pick it up with adult side of things, and I'm certainly sticking around to answer any questions you have. I could talk about this forever because it is no doubt a big, big concern of mine. And I, I appreciate being invited here today because I can tell you we're watching the beginning of the process. And this is where we have to cut it off in addition to supporting everybody who's already injured by addiction. Thank you for your time.